Thank you very much, Father, for that very kind introduction. Um, this is weird. I feel like I should be whispering or something. I've never <laughs> preached in a church. I'm honored to do so, but I'll have to watch my language, I guess, right? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I've had COVID. Anybody else get COVID yet? Okay, so I'm, we're like a couple, two or three weeks out of it. You know that little COVID fog? We, we sailed right through it. We had the vitamin I and everything and did all the vitamins and we did fine, but there's been that little kind of a weird fog ever since. So um, giving a talk in a church, I guess, just fits into the whole COVID thing for me. So I'm, uh, but I'm very, very happy to be here because um, for one thing, I, I love to drive. So the drive from Minnesota down here, from St. Paul down, down here, was absolutely gorgeous today. And it just reminded me um, coming to be with you, and it's my honor to be with you. You are the clans. You are the underground church uh, to varying degrees. It reminded me that some things just aren't going to change. God is still in his heavens, you know. Uh, the sky today was gorgeous. The temperature was beautiful. It's a gorgeous fall day, just like all we all remember from when we were kids. God is still with us. And everything that's happening in the world right now seems to be trying to convince us that there's been a fundamental change to such an extent that we all need to be terrified, afraid of everything, afraid of the flu, afraid now of climate change. Are you terrified of climate change? Do you wake up every day and worry about the polar bears or the ice caps? Can you imagine how demented it would be if that's what we were doing to our children, scaring the living daylights out of them over things like that. And I think it's so important to realize what's going on here. I don't know if you guys, maybe some of you saw a video that we did this week in which little Greta Thunberg, you know who I'm talking about? The little, how dare you, how dare you? Well, it was interesting. She's in Glasgow right now for the conference, for the big climate change conference. Apparently she wasn't invited to speak because she's just as sick and tired of the nonsense, fear-mongering politics going on there as we are. Now, that's not to suggest that she's on our side because she still thinks she has this big cause about climate and all of that, but she can recognize nonsense and blarney, I gotta be careful, I'm in church, uh, when she sees it. So the left, I say, I bring this up to you because the left is not unified at all. And I think the right, and I hate to use that left and right, but for expedience sake, I'm going to. I think the other side of all this is becoming extremely unified. We've never seen unity like we have right now, especially as traditional Catholics, but also as conservatives. Look what happened in Virginia. That's amazing what happened in Virginia. I, I went to school at Christendom College, and I'm still just amazed that Virginia all of a sudden seems to be not only waking up a little bit, but rejecting communism, rejecting critical race theory, rejecting the abuse of our children, sexual abuse of our children and the, and the attack on parents. There are so many things that we can look at that should make us, and that I think God is giving us these signs. We need to stay positive. I don't mean that in a little life coach sort of way, you know, come on guys, we can do it. I mean really, really positive in a supernatural way. God has given us the vision to see what's going, what's going on in the world today. Not only us, but many, many, many people are joining us now to varying degrees. Politicians even, I don't know if you noticed this, Glenn uh, Youngkin, two days before the election in Virginia, he says, he said in front of cameras, well, we can't allow this critical race to be taught because it's racist and we are all united in Jesus Christ as Americans. Now that's fairly significant that in Virginia, a very diverse place, he would use the name of our Lord. You know why he did that? You know why he wasn't afraid to mention Jesus Christ? Because the tide is changing, friends. Because not just us, but conservatives and politics, many, many evangelical Protestants, they're looking at what's happening at Davos, at the United Nations, now in the presidency of the United States with Biden, who of course is not the president at all in a normal sense, he's just a puppet. And they're seeing a very, very dark vision of the future. And all along, friends, we've had an opportunity as traditional Catholics, I don't want to presume too much, maybe some of you are new to traditional Catholicism, I assume many of you may be. It's not just the Latin Mass. It's never been just about the Latin Mass. But the pioneers of this movement understood that we must remain engaged 
in the political war as well. As traditional Catholics, we cannot just go to Mass and then sit out the political war that's going on. And that war, that war for polit in politics is becoming more of a holy war every day. Look what they're doing to us. Look what they're doing to the economy. It's intentional. Don't for one second think that Joe Biden is making mistakes. Kamala Harris is making mistakes. That, 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 that the insufferable Nancy Pelosi is simply making political mistakes. Friends, they're dismantling our country on purpose. Everything they're doing, dismantling our country on purpose. Why? Because they want to start a new world order. I don't care if that sounds like Alex Jones and conspiracy theories. It's happening right outside of our doors in Dubuque and Platteville up in Minneapolis. Oh my gosh, they're literally burning the city down. They're trying to outlaw the police. Why? Because they want to destroy this country. That is why they hated Donald Trump because he was building America strong. You can't have strong countries right now. They want to have a, a, an equal, a, a flat playing field so they can build a diabolical new world order. Now, what is that new world order going to be built on? And you know the answer to this, but this is a key moment when we have to remind ourselves. They are building it, friends, on the ashes of Christendom. They are building it on the destroyed kingship the social kingship of Jesus Christ. And this is what, what I want to remind us about tonight. 40, 50, 60 years ago, when the traditional Catholic movement began, and I was just a kid, they were, the, the traditional Catholic pioneers were just as concerned about the destruction or the war against the social kingship of Jesus Christ as they were on the war against the mass, the traditional mass. Because they realize that you can't separate church, uh, uh, the church and state. They're not separating the church and state. They want to co-opt the Catholic Church. And they want to co-opt all of Christianity in order to build this new order that's going to be utterly godless. But the point is, what we see now as Catholics, as traditional Catholics, we see a war on what now coming from the Vatican? We see a war on the traditional Latin Mass. Doesn't that just seem like the most absurd thing in the world with all of the problems in the world? Why does the Vatican wish to crush us? You can get very sad about them. By the way, I say nothing about Francis, about what's happening in the Vatican for the point of being sensationalist. We just have to be honest about what's happening. I don't say it because I want to scandalize you or I want to make points because look at how smart and brave I am. I can call names about the, with the people in the Vatican. We as Catholics, as humble lay Catholics, most of us, have simply got to be honest. What is going on over there? What are they doing? The Pope's representative is in Glasgow right now at the climate summit telling the world that this is the biggest problem that confronts mankind. Climate change, the biggest problem. Something must be done about this. Wouldn't it be fantastic if the Vatican sent the message that the biggest problem in the world today was apostasy? Wouldn't it be fantastic if the Vatican cared as much about abortion as they do about climate change? What happened to that? And yet that's where, that's where we are. So we, we see this role then. Traditional Catholicism is a problem. Why? And again, we can look at it in a very depressing sense, like, like, like we're persecuted, or we could turn it around a little bit and say, well, why would this be unless it were because traditional Catholicism is the answer to everything. Traditional Catholicism, which includes the proclamation of the kingship of Christ. And don't forget this, Christ is king. When the Nazis were, were rampaging across Europe and the Soviets were coming across from the other side and the world was blowing up back in the 1930s and 40s, what did the Catholic Church do? What did Pius XI do? Do you suggest dialogue and ecumenism and going along to get along and all of this? No. He comes out with an encyclical and he declares the kingship of Christ. He says every nation must be subject to Jesus Christ the King. That was his answer. And you know why that was his answer? Because he's right. Because that's exactly what the world needs right now. The proclamation, we've rejected that kingship, 
and we have chaos in our streets. We have millions of babies being aborted. We have cities now burning down. We have no future. It's not just a religious issue, in other words. It's a political issue, this rejection of the kingship of Christ. So I would encourage you, as we face a tough time, you know what Cardinal Supich is going to do to the Latin Mass in Chicago? He's going to crush it. He tells us that he has to do this because he's accompanying people in traditionis custodis. He's, in, he's, accompanying all of his, he's accompanying them so that they can understand why it's important to bury forever the old Roman rite. Now, again, we can get very upset about that, about that. We can call ourselves victims and we can whine and scream and yell, or we can turn it around and say, wait a minute. From the beginning, so traditional Catholics have been echoing the slogan, the battle cry of the Catholics of the Western Uprising in England. And you know what that was, that slogan that they use, it's the mass that matters. When they're talking about the traditional Latin mass, it's the mass that matters is what they said as they were pers being persecuted in England, in the Vendée in France, Southern France, Western France, and also in Mexico much more recently in the 1920s. It's the mass that matters. So what we found out now through the course, the course of this bizarre time where they're coming after the traditional mass seemingly so randomly, what we can understand is that they were right. Men like Michael Davies, men like Archbishop Lefebvre, they were right when they said it's the mass that matters. So I'm really not that upset with Francis on one, on one hand. He's confirmed it. It is the mass that matters. What we fight for matters more than anything else. And if we are successful in this fight for the restoration of the mass, if we are successful, we will be with those who will change history. We will be with that remnant that will become larger and larger throughout the world. We will be what our Lord meant when he said, I will be with you always, even unto the consummation of the world. When Our Lady said that in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Well, this isn't in some obscure way that we won't understand. It's going to, her, her triumph is going to be through human beings. Christ will be with human beings until the end. We have the opportunity to be a part of that. And we now have confirmation from the Vatican itself that the fight that you and your parents and your children probably and your grandparents were fighting for the restoration of the Latin Mass poses a direct threat to this diabolical new world order. And that's what we must think about every time we get up and we say, now what are we going to do? They're coming after our mass. What are we going to do? We're going to fight and we're going to keep the faith. And we have this great honor to stand with those who did it before throughout history. And you know what? This may scandalize you. Francis says in Traditionis Custodis that he must, he must curb access to the Latin mass because it's disunifying, and because many people who are involved with the traditional Latin Mass have a problem with the revolution. He just says Vatican II. Of course, he doesn't, he doesn't make the distinction, does he? Because we don't have any problem with what in Vatican II, what was taught that's authentic, that's doctrinally binding. We accept all of it as traditional Catholics, don't we? What's ever a reiteration of the previous teachings of the church? We reject the novelty. So in a way, I agree with Francis. We do reject the novelty and the spirit of Vatican II, which have run roughshod over the traditional faith. So on several levels, what's happening in Rome right now confirms us in the faith. And we need to concentrate on that. And we need to think about that. We need to pray about that, support it, and get prepared, as Bishop Athanasius Schneider says, get prepared to go into the church underground. The underground church you will not leave that church. It's going to become very interesting because you know what? There was a certain complacency that was beginning to set in. I'll tell you something. I'll take you back in time a little bit because I remember this very, very well the first time it happened. And I would invite you to consider what it was like then, back in the early 70s. Everybody was so excited about the felt banners and the guitars and th trashing the sanctuary, getting rid of the high altar, busting up the... The communion rail. It was all so beautiful and it was gonna, we didn't have the, the benefit of 2020 hindsight. So they were telling us this was a great dawning of a new age. That was a lonely, lonely time. 
Thousands of priests left the priesthood. Tens of thousands of nuns and sisters left the religious order at that time. The church began to fall apart. And there was this little group, this little group of traditional Catholics. There was no Society of St. Pius X. There was no Fraternity of St. Peter. There was no Institute of Christ the King. There were no diocesan priests that had gone back to the Latin Mass. There were just a couple of priests that held out. Most of them were thrown out of their parishes. And so I have even somebody my age, I know I'm old, but not ancient, but even I remember when things were a lot worse than they are right now. When the only way I could ever go to a Latin Mass is when we used to call them the, the men in black. The priests would come on a little circuit. They were kicked out. They didn't have pension. They didn't have a parish. They had no financial security. They didn't have an internet to raise money for the fact that they were now independent or whatever you wanted to call it. And they would go on this circuit and they would come to homes like mine and they would offer the Latin Mass. My mother and father rescued an altar, high altar, from the local church and, <laughs> and put it in our basement. And as I've said before, that could be kind of awkward when the guys would come over to shoot pool and I'm a 10, 12, 15 year old kid and there's this big altar in our basement. They would say, well, what's going on? But that's where it was, friends. There was no mass at the local church. There was nothing. There was nothing. And yet, now I was confirmed by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre when I was 10 years old. There were no bishops. There was no Cardinal Burke. There was no Archbishop Vigano. There was no Bishop Schneider. There was no Bishop Strickland. We had none of that consolation, friends, that you in this room have that is a direct gift from Almighty God. And I was inspired as a child. I'm, I can still see myself kneeling in the floor in the basement of my father's home. A little child. That's where I learned to serve the Mass the swish of the vestments, the low masses of the priests that would come from all over the world. Not many of them, but they would come, some with accents, because they didn't speak much, speak much English sometimes. And they brought us the mass. And out of that, that little flickering, that pilot light of the old faith, blossomed and grew such a magnificent movement, which was blessed by God. You can't go to a city in this country, a good-sized city, and not find the Latin Mass. You see, those traditionalists back then, they had confidence, they had faith. They knew that ultimately Christ would save the church. It's not up to us. They knew he would. All we had to do was be faithful, friends. And from that, the movement became so powerful. I've walked the Chartres pilgrimage from Paris to Chartres, a 70-mile walk. I've walked it 30 times. Thousands and thousands of young people from all over the world walked it with me from every country you can think of. And they're still with us. They're still out there just like you are, trying to decide what to do about Traditionis Custodis. And they're going to resist. And we need to resist as well. And that's what's meant by Unite the Clans. We need to resist. Because this is of God. I heard from with my own ears a couple of weeks ago, Bishop Athanasius Schneider said, the legalism... The legalism that they're trying to force to coerce us into obeying laws that are not just, that legalism must go. Because the point of that kind of legalism was to preserve the faith. All around us, we are losing the faith. They're closing our churches. They're shutting down our schools. We're losing children. We're losing parents, cousins, going into losing the faith, going into apostasy. We need to make sure that we resist. But most importantly, and I can close on this and take some questions, and I think you already know all of this, but what I, the reason I wanted to come here tonight was because I love talking to people like you, just like me. We need to get ready for something bad that's coming, but we're not going to lose. We are not going to lose this war. And there's another kind of an idea I'd like to leave with you. And that's this idea that we don't need to see what has to be done now what we need to do, the fight that we need to put up, we don't necessarily have to lead with that that's a duty, that's a hardship, that's a terrible thing that we're going to have to fight, that we're going to have to go underground, that we're going to have to support our priests even if they need to become on some sort of irregular basis with their bishop. We need to support them. That can be seen in two ways. A cross, an unbelievable cross, friends, 
or it can be seen as the greatest honor that we will ever have in our lives. That in a moment in history, when they're not only turning against God, but they're turning against the unborn, slaughtering the unborn, turning against the family, and now even turning against the country, turning against law and order. This is demonic, what we're facing. It's evil, straight up evil. And there's only one answer for that. And that is the traditional faith of our fathers. So many good people have been deceived and they've lost the faith. We all know relatives who've lost the faith because they're scandalized and discouraged and they lost heart and they can't fight anymore. Why is it that we're here tonight ready to fight? Because we know we can't go without the church. We can't do it without the church. We don't want to face God at the end of our lives without a priest, without confession, without the last rites. We're serving the church. We're defending the church. And it's also our honor to stand with her at a time when everyone, even people in the Vatican, are turning against her. So I would encourage you to spread that message to your friend, to your family, especially to your children. Tell them the old stories. I don't have much time tonight, but tell them the stories. Tell them about the traditional Catholics who made the very lonely stand down through history for the faith. Tell them about the Vendée Uprising, where a, hundred, where fifth, or a half a million traditional Catholics were slaughtered rather than give up on the mass of our fathers rather than give up on the priests, the traditional priests, rather than give up on the doctrines of the faith. A half million, that's a big number. That was the first act of genocide from the Enlightenment to go into France, Western France, and wipe out a half million traditional Catholics. Tell them the stories about the Vendée. Tell them the stories about the Cristeros. How many Cristeros died? Viva Cristo Rey, why? For Christ the King. For Christ the King, that's what Viva Cristo Rey means. Long live Christ the King. May he reign. You see, Christ the King. They're responding to Pius XI. They're responding to the church's call to go out and fight for Christ the King. To fight for the traditions of our faith. And most importantly, to fight for all, everything that's involved with the faith of our fathers, friends. So unite the clans, yes. What is that? What is unite the clans? It's what we're doing right now. I'm not talking about, well, let's, let's work to unite the fraternity and the pious attention. Those are difficult things for another time. I'm talking about uniting us, all of us, the traditional Catholics who are going to be underground now for a while and who are going to make it through, are going to survive. And someday, if we do it right, if we keep the faith, they'll be telling our story. Just like we're telling the story of the Vendée or telling the story of the Cristeros. That's what we want. That's what we, to, to do what we promised at a time of our confirmation. To rather die than deny a single doctrine of the faith. To become true soldiers of Jesus Christ. I know you know this already or you wouldn't be here. But I hope you'll leave tonight thinking more about the honor that this is, that's involved here. The thrill the challenge than the mere duty to do what we have to do. And that's going to keep us together in the days that, the, the days that, that, that are coming. And keep in mind, for, for all, those of you who are older, people my age even who remember, this is not the worst time. We have infrastructure, support, bishops, and great priests all around the world. We're not going to give up. We're not going to back down. And that's the message we send to Supich and whoever your bishop is here, ultimately, that's the message we send to Francis. We will never back down. We will never surrender. We will always stand for the mass, for family, and for the social kingship of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for, for listening tonight, and I'm happy to take some questions if you like.